We will wait for one more minute, then we will start our today's sessions. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining with us. Uh, today we are on 11th sessions of our uh, PICO training, uh, which is started, uh, which was... No, it's, I'm unmuted. Okay. Which was, uh, which was uh, started on 26th of uh, June, and we will be completing this course on 26th of July. So today we are on 11th sessions, and today we have a topic on weaning from ventilator, which will be taken by Dr. Rosina Ma'am. And next topic will be electrolyte distributions in uh, PICO recognitions and management will be taken by Dr. Arun. So before uh, proceeding with our topic, I would like to invite our invitee, sir, uh, Dr. Karthi, sir. Uh, sir is a associate professor in pediatric emergency and intensive care unit, advanced pediatric center in PGI Chandigarh. Sir has an intensive care done an intensive care training in PGI Chandigarh and Royal Children Hospital, Malbore. And sir, area of interest is a tropical infections, decay and quality and safety. So I would like to thank you, sir, for joining with us. I think screen is visible now. Yeah. Okay. So uh, thank you, sir, for uh, joining with us. I think sir is there. I think sir got disconnected. Okay. And then uh, now I would like to invite our first presenter, Dr. Rosina, ma'am, for the uh, presentations of our first topic. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much, Nanuka. Is my screen visible now? Share. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Nanuka. I um, also uh, I'd like to welcome all of you. Good afternoon and uh, a warm welcome to Dr. Karthi. Thank you so much for uh, being with us today and uh, hopefully uh, clear most of our doubts because this is one topic that we normally just uh, we don't follow any set protocol really just through uh, what our seniors have been doing we just following the same thing so if there's any change anything different so dr kathy will be there to uh, help us clarify uh, our doubts or any uh, changes that we need to do so uh, when we talk about weaning from ventilation uh, today we uh, i'll talk about introduction to weaning uh, what is spontaneous breeding trial uh, case scenarios what is extubation failure and we'll summarize the piece Oh, this is not a slide. Hold on. No. It just give us two minutes and we'll just come back. Uh, just slight uh, change in the slide here. Mm -hmm. Let me just keep me in paint, right? I've copied the... Yes, ma'am. I'm 
Uh, sorry, just give us a uh, two minutes. Okay, there is just replacement in the slide. Just give us a uh, two minutes. <laughs> Okay, but that's the old one you was coming. Which one? This photo, Nano. Nano, no, this one. This is Nano, you know? This one. Can I just open from here only? Yeah. Copy and paste? Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's copy this one right here. Yes. Let's paste it here again. Yeah, it should be Um, my slides visible. Yeah? Okay. So when we talk about uh, today's topic, we'll tr I'll try to cover. Um, where is this? I'll try to uh, introduce what weaning is and um, what spontaneous breeding trial is. Uh, we'll go to briefly one case scenario. And we'll also talk about extubation failure and try to summarize about uh, weaning from ventilator. So the principle in weaning is basically you have to maintain your saturation above 94% and uh, with an aim of a PO2 of more than 66 millimeter of mercury, the patient has to be hemodynamically stable. Only then when you fulfill these criteria on your, uh, uh, what do you call uh, hemodynamics and uh, respiratory monitoring, then you can plan for weaning. Okay, so before we plan for weaning, there. Or discontinuating the patient from the ventilation. Uh, when do you when will you consider weaning? So if you have some or complete reversal of the underlying causes of respiratory failure. So depending on what is your indication for your uh, mechanical ventilation or intubation in the first place, you need to assess that primary condition. That is uh, that was the indication for intubating the patient. So uh, once you uh, once you have uh, sort of have some reversal or uh, some recovery of the underlying cause, then you can see your other parameters that will uh, lead you to think of weaning of the patient and finally extubating from the ventilator. So these pa uh, respiratory uh, parameters we monitor, so these are our endpoint basically at the end of our uh, for ventilation. So we have to uh, check for adequacy of ventilation. We, uh, oxygenation, we already know this. You look at your a PO2 and on a minimum PEEP and minimum FiO2 and with a PF ratio of uh, normal of more than 300. There should be no significant respiratory distress for the uh, child and there is improved breath sounds. Then uh, what are the circulate, uh, circulatory or cardiovascular monitors, uh, parameters you have to look for? Here, the patient should have a stable circulation with normal heart rate for age, stable blood pressure on uh, no or minimal vaso, uh, Pressor or inotropes are uh, required for maintaining the blood pressure. And hemoglobin should be between 8 and 10 uh, gram per deciliter and should be afebrile. Then you have your other parameters besides respiratory and cardiovascular because a number of times we do need to intubate or uh, give respiratory support based on your CNS status or neuromuscular status. So if that is your condition or even in, if you're intubating for other uh, purposes, so you have to still look at your neuromuscular parameters. That is adequate uh, mental status or GCS, a GCS uh, score of more than 13, 
He should be off sedation and the patient should be capable of initiating a respiratory effort and should be having adequate cuff reflex. So these are the parameters that you have to see to decide whether you, this patient is ready for weaning or not. Then for weaning, you can, uh, like I said, like what we have been doing, the standard weaning, or if you have a weaning protocol that you are following, you can do that. But then now, uh, how do you actually start weaning? Okay, so you have to test the patient for extubation readiness. So this, this should be done daily. It should not be like you're ventilating the patient and then you have, uh, you know, just forgotten and monitored and that's it. You have to keep on daily, uh, you have to keep on assessing the patient daily. You can either again follow a standardized protocol or use uh, whatever policies and protocol you have in your uh, institute. Um, this, what you do is when, you, when you're doing this daily assessment, it actually reduces the time uh, to extubation and facilitates early extubation as well. Again, the criteria will be your vital, vital signs, your ventilator criteria we've already talked about, your PF ratio. And then also one more thing is uh, presence of endotracheal cuff leak. This is something that we are also not practicing. So it'd be good to have our expert comment on this. And it says if the leak volume is nil or low, then the corticosteroid should be prescribed. So again, we should know when we should start like, giving our corticosteroid before we, uh, before we extubate. Then uh, once you have uh, reached your, uh, you've decided that the patient is uh, stable, uh, you should consider, you should start weaning. Okay, so once the FIU2 is less than uh, 0.4 or 40%, your secretions are minimal. Again, the child is having clinical improvement. If it's a patient of ARDS or uh, pneumonia, then there's some clinical improvement in the uh, chest, there's neurological improvement in the chest X-ray. Then what you do is if you're thinking of extubating the patient, you should always start weaning. Okay, so uh, if you're using muscle relaxant, again, we hardly, you should stop using that, stop it. Then you should start thinking of weaning the sedation. So follow the sedation holiday protocol that we have covered, Dr. Anna has covered. So you uh, give the patient a uh, weaning of sedation. And then uh, once you've done that, then you can think of titrating other parameters. Okay, so what we normally do is once you've reached a FIO2 of less than 40%, then we titrate our pressure support. We normally use pressure control ventilation, so we titrate our pressure support. So we reduce our PEEP, if our PEEP is 20 or 22, we reduce it by two. And then uh, once we reduce the PEEP, then we touch the PWEP PEEP. Okay, so sub keep on reducing these two until you reach a minimum setting of a P of four, four to five centimeter of water and PIP of 14 to 15 centimeter of water. So once we reduce this, then we uh, then reduce the respiratory rate. Uh, so in that case, I mean, uh, that, uh, that's something that we do. And then uh, tidal volume, if you are uh, using a, like a tidal or what you call a volume guaranteed or a, a volume controlled uh, ventilation, you can uh, titrate the tidal volume to no less than five ml per kilo. This is to prevent atlactasis. Uh, trigger sensitivity, we don't uh, titrate. Whatever we set, we normally keep it at that only. We don't reduce it anymore. So again, we can, I would invite Dr. Kathy to uh, comment on this one. Uh, once we have uh, reduced all the setting, then we give us a trial of spontaneous breathing trial. Okay, so either you, uh, common modality use is we can use a T-piece uh, circuit or a C-circuit. We normally use a T-piece and the duration is about 60 minutes. And uh, for, uh, this is how a TPS will look like. And what we also do is, I mean, once we've reached a minimum setting on the respiration on, a, on the ventilator, patient's hemodynamically status, uh, hemodynamically stable, and there's no other indication that uh, requires the patient to be on ventilatory support, then we also do a uh, put we put the patient on spontaneous mode. If you're having Galileo, there's a spontaneous mode breathing. If you're having this dagger, you have this spontaneous CPAP thing with. maintaining saturation. Okay, so we'll talk more about uh, spontaneous breathing trial. So uh, what we do is once we give a trial of spontaneous breathing, we put the patient in TPs for about one hour or so. Then we have to monitor the patient. We have to see whether he's able to uh, maintain his uh, respiratory and hemodynamic status without the help of the machine. Okay, so these are our endpoints that we have to look at. His saturation should be maintained above 85 to 90%. PO2 between 50 and 60 mm of mercury and pH should be above 7.32. The increase in PCO2 should be less than or equal to 45 mm of mercury. And then in that period, when you are giving a, a, a spontaneous breathing trial, he should have uh, his hemodynamic parameter should also be normal. He can be again, whatever presses, uh, vasoactive 
agent you're giving, it should be minimal. You shouldn't have to hike that up. There should be no tachycardia. His heart rate and blood pressure should not be changed, if at all, also not more than nine, not more than twenty percent. And then when you're looking at the ventilatory pattern, even his respiratory rate should not be having increased work of breathing or tachypnea. He should not change to more than fifty percent of, of what you have set or what the age uh, required for that age is. And the patient should be awake and alert during this continuous breathing trial. Okay, so once you've uh, achieved all this uh, uh, endpoint, that means your spontaneous breathing trial is successful then you can plan for extubation. So what we normally do is if we have kept the patient on feeds, we keep him in uh, nil for oral for about six hours. So you can keep the patient nil for oral in the morning at 6 a.m. in the morning. And then once you finish rounds or you finish other things then by 12 o'clock or one o'clock, we can uh, extubate the patient. In small children, we can give uh, IV dexamethasone uh, six hours again before at 0 0.6 milligram per kilo. Then you find it and you extubate. Okay, so what we what you can do is you can either extubate to room air if there's no underlying uh, lung pathology, or what we normally do is we we uh, ask like a thing what you call we normally just uh, extubate them to nasal prongs. Very rarely, only on maybe in newborns or young patient that we extubate we we extubate to CPAP. So again, this is what we normally uh, do in us uh, in our cases. Then after monitoring, again, the after extubation, monitoring is very important because a lot of these patients can go into failure, uh, extubation failure, because of not, not able to pick up what you call the what you call your their uh, hemodynamics and respiratory pattern during the initial phase of the extubation. So we need to pick up, uh, look for post-extubation strider. We need to look for increased work of breathing, like they're having tachypnea, they're having recessions, nasal flaring, increased oxygen requirement, all those cases. You have to monitor for that. And keep always keep the ventilator and on standby for this for this particular patient when you have extubated. Then you continue with your rest of the other vital monitoring. Then uh, what happens if there's what is a spontaneous breathing trial failure? Okay, so like I said, there's increased work of breathing, and if you've done a gas, there's inadequate gas exchange. The saturation is consistently falling below eighty five percent. Your PO two when you've done a gas, it's less than fifty uh, to sixty mm of mercury. Your pH has come down, it's become more acidotic. The child is going to respiratory acidosis. Here, your PO, PCO2 is also increased. So in this case, you know that the patient is not able to maintain his gas exchange is, uh, without the ventilator. And then also, if the child tends to be if it's agitated or there's increased somnolence, increased sleeping or lethargy, uh, or he's having other uh, hemodynamic instability like tachycardia or hypertension, even hypotension as well. So in that case, you know that you have your spontaneous breathing trial has failed. Okay, so you don't you don't uh, wean them off uh, the ventilator, you don't extubate basically. And what you do is you put back on the ventilator support, whatever support you have given before, be it, uh, uh, what do you call it, SIMV mode or uh, BiPAP or whatever, C uh, CPAP or pressure support, whatever support you were given before, you put the patient back and then you keep it for 20, you keep uh, the patient in the same setting for 24 hours and then you can try again the next day after 24 hours. So let's come to our case. We have a three-year-old boy, Kevin, who was admitted with history of fever for five days, a cough for three days, and not eating since two days. So on examination, oh, okay. this slide is gone. Okay, so on examination, he was um, he was found to be uh, tachycardic. He was uh, having cold, clammy skin. His pulses were weak. His CRT was prolonged. And uh, his uh, on uh, then uh, what do you call his chest was showing bilateral crepes. CVS examination was normal. CNS he was uh, lethargic, and pupils were equal and uh, reacting. And his uh, there was no meningeal signs. Okay, so then what we did was uh, he was obviously a sick child, so we had initially stabilized him. We kept oxygen uh, initially by a face mask. Blood samples for uh, uh, venous blood gas, for blood culture, for CBC, for RBS, and other uh, routine uh, uh, investigation that we had uh, we required. And on the other line, we given a 20 ml bolus of normal saline within the next three, or next uh, 30 minutes. Okay, so once we had done that, then we um, then we uh, reassessed again. So his heart he was tachycardic, heart rate was 180 per minute. When we reassessed, his heart rate was about 140 per minute and his temperature was 38. So the increase in heart rate was out of proportion of the temperature, uh, increase in the uh, temperature. So uh, what we did was he was still, his CRT was still prolonged. His pulse had, uh, it's only his heart rate has come down. His CRT was still prolonged, pulse was still weak. 
So we had decided to um, shift this child to the PICU. What we did was we had uh, uh, intubated him after RSI and then we uh, shifted him to PICU. Once we reached PICU, we within the first hour, we had given first dose of antibiotics and then we had given a second uh, bolus of, second bol uh, second NS bolus. Okay, so here it is. So we had, once we had uh, shifted the child to uh, an ICU, we had given a first dose of antibiotics and we had repeated the second bolus. And we've kept him on uh, ventilator with initial setting as respiratory rate as appropriate for age, P of initially six, PRP of 18, uh, TI of 0.6, IE ratio of one is to 2.3, FIO2 initially at 100%, then we are gradually reduced it to 70%. Then uh, this child, after the second, bol uh, second bolus, we had then uh, started him uh, over the next hour, we found he was still tachycardic. His blood pressure here, you see, is 80 by 55. So we started him on inotrope, on adrenaline, which was gradually titrated and increased to 0.5 microgram per kilo per minute. After, uh, after this first hour, the next over one hour, his heart rate gradually reduced to 120 per minute. The saturation was 95% with this ventilator setting. So we didn't, uh, so we could, uh, we were continuing to titrate our FIO2. CRT was less than three seconds. Pulse volume were better. Therapies were warm now. He has passed urine and his BP is 78 by 58, which is just above the fifth percentile for his uh, age. And we, we looked at the uh, investigation. Initially, his before intubation, this was his BBG. VH was 7.12. PCO2 retention was there. PO2 was 60. Bicarb was 20. Lactate was 3.4. Okay, so based on this, we had diagnosed him as a case of semen pneumonia with septic shock. And then uh, his x-ray showed bilateral infiltrates. So other reports were showing hemoglobin of 8 gram per deciliter, TLC counts was high, failure was low, so this will require further monitoring. And other parameters like LFT coagulation profile were normal. Then basic care and PIC was followed. Then subsequently, after two hours, or two to three hours after his initial stabilization, his ABG showed uh, was almost uh, normal. Okay, PCO, uh, pH of 7.40, PCO 2.40 by carb of 24. Then we start him on maintenance fluid of 70 to 8%, 80% of his requirement according to the holiday SEGA formula. And after 12 hours of self stabilization, we start him on NG feed and his full feeding was achieved in the next 24 hours and the rest of the monitoring was done as per protocol. Now, uh, what we did was we continued mechanical ventilation for about 48 hours or so for this child until we had titrated or tapered the FIO2 to 40%. So in the next 48 hours, we could finally reduce FIO2 to 40%. The next 48 to 72 hours, the, we then titrated the PEP uh, P -E -P and the PIP, and then the respiratory rate. His inotropes was also uh, gradually reduced to 0.1 microgram per kilo per minute, which was achieved by day three of the ventilation. His fever has subsided. Overall, he has responded and showed some improvement. Then what we what we did next was we weaned off the uh, we weaned off his sedation by uh, following the uh, protocol, and we gave a trial of SBT. Again, this is again optional for this case. Uh, we just uh, once we reached a minimum uh, setting, we had just extubated him. Before that, we would held feet for uh, six hours, and then we planned extubation to nasal prongs. Okay, so what we did at this case is following that criteria. Our FI2 was we reduced FI2 first. Then we worked on our pressure settings, and then we reduced our. Uh, we were on minimal anotropic support, so we had a uh, wean of our uh, sedation. We gave a trial of uh, SBT or just spontaneous mode. Then we would help feed, and then we finally extubated. Okay, so uh, another thing we want to talk. So we following that put over that um, that uh, process, we could finally extubate this child. Now, what is extubation failure? So a couple of times when we don't plan our weaning properly, or sometimes a child just gets extubated and we uh, keep we tr give a trial, like, you know, keep them on CPAP or any other NIV uh, with positive pressure ventilation support, then there is a chance of extubation failure. Okay, so what is extubation failure? Is inability to sustain spontaneous breathing after removal of artificial airway. Okay, so why do we need to, uh, again, like if you are scared of failure, then why are we even doing Weaning, isn't it? So if we fail to recognize opportunities for extubation, that is extubation readiness, or if we have unsuccessful attempts at extubation known as extubation failure, but what this does is it actually increases your PICU stay, increases your hospital mortality, prolonged your length of stay in the hospital. It also has a higher hospital cost. Okay, so we, you need to identify uh, which patient are fit for extubation or which patient needs to continue on ventilator. 
Okay, so the rate of exhibition failure in PICU is about uh, 3 to 30 percent and usually occurs about 24 to uh, 24 hours to 96 hours of extubation. This number is actually very high, but there are some few uh, studies uh, recently that show that about four to six percent only. So uh, this type, these are the types of extubation failure we can have. One is immediate, that is again, when it's unplanned, there's um, accidental extubation, you try to keep the child on CPAP or another, um, what do you call, positive pressure, ventilation support, and then the patient gradually fail, um, has increased work of bleeding, and then you need to uh, reintubate again. And then early is if there's failure within 48 to 72 hours, and late is up to uh, seven days of extubation. Okay, so um, what are the causes of extubation failure? So normally it's seen in younger age uh, group. This is a study done in, published in uh, 2005. Okay, so this was in younger children, they found that um, children less than six months, children with cardiac diseases, they have higher rates of extubation failure. In their study also, it was like only 4% of uh, extubation uh, failure in their case. Another study which was published in 2003, younger children less than 24 months, if there's any uh, syndromic or uh, genetic uh, abnormality, there's a higher chance of uh, extubation um, failure. If there's any medical or surgical airway condition, if the child has chronic respiratory or chronic neuro neurological condition, you uh, should expect, you know, um, prolonged ventilation or extubation failure. In this case, again, if the child has chronic NIV, uh, non-invasive ventilation with positive pressure support ventilation, even in that case, you can have higher chance of failure. If you need to replace the ET on admission to PICU, this is a case study found by uh, this uh, particular group. And we use, need to use racemic epinephrine, steroid, and helium oxygen therapy. I think this is mainly for your chronic lung disease and all, okay, which we hardly encounter. And if you need, uh, if the need for NIV PPV within 24 hours of extubation. So these, with this two study, they found that these were the uh, common condition where you have extubation failures. Okay, so let's just look at a few risk factors that can lead to extubation failure. One is if your, obviously if your primary condition why you're extubating this is not resolved, you are going to have extubation failure. Okay, then if you have an in inefficient cuff reflex, you will have extubation failure. There's tracheal congestion, there's lots of secretions. You will, you will again fail, a uh, patient will, inevitably require re, uh, intubation again. Inefficient swallowing, inadequate alertness, your GCS is poor, the patient is still lethargic, again, you'll need to intubate the child again. There's food overload, okay, this again uh, can also lead to extubation failure. And there are certain risk factors for laryngeal edema that will, again, like that's a local cause, not your uh, systemic cause, this can lead to extubation failure. So uh, female sex, nasal intubation, excessive uh, size of orotracheal tube, this we don't use in children nasal intubation. So if you're using a bigger size of uh, endotracheal tube, then again, you can uh, uh, have a higher chance of extubation failure. We're using a high cuff pressure in the tube. So if you remember on our talk on the basic care for a uh, pediatric pa uh, patient in ICU, you remember that the endotracheal cuff pressure should be maintained between 20 to 25 centimeters of water. So if you have a higher cuff, there's a higher chance of uh, extub uh, extubation failure or if you have like a difficult, traumatic, or multiple attempts at intubation or prolonged intubation, that means prolonged ventilator stay, you can have a higher risk, a higher chance of extubation failure. So to uh, summarize, uh, what is the current recommendation is you need to daily assess for uh, extubation readiness uh, trial uh, or testing. You have to give a spontaneous uh, breathing trial using your whatever your clinical practice guideline is or any standard protocol. Uh, we should uh, look for methods to facilitate early removal of the ET tube in case of a patient that requires prolonged intubation, like uh, early tracheostomy. And look for specific factors for extubation failure. If you have attempted extubation and you have not able to have not been able to extubate the child, and then uh, if there's a high risk of failure, then you can consider extubation to non-invasive forms of positive pressure ventilation. Then these are more advanced mode of uh, ventilation, like your newly um, uh, what's it called, um, nearly adjusted ventilator assist modes. If you have this, they can, they can detect diaphragmatic uh, paralysis or diaphragmatic activities. If you have this advanced mode, you can check um, whether the child is able to initiate uh, spontaneous breathing. Okay, so I think with this, we come to the end of my topic. These are my uh, references. Hold on, okay. Can you stop sharing screen? 
uh, yes. Uh, thank you so much, uh, ma'am, for the presentations. I have seen Dr. Bipul Kumar, sir, also. Sir, you are able to hear us? So, uh, today as an invitee, yes. Thank you, sir. We are able to see you. So, today we have a Dr. Uh, Bipul Kumar Das, sir, also. We, uh, sir, has joined with us. Sir is an assistant professor in the Department of Pediatric in Tejpur, Assam. So, thank you for uh, joining with us. So without much delay, now I would like to request Karthik, sir, to put input on this regard, on this topic, sir. Thank you, Nanuka. And uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Rosina. It, it was a very comprehensive and uh, uh, presentation which has covered every aspect of uh, weaning. So I'll just give the comments and then we'll have the discussion later. That's how it goes. Yes, sir. Yeah, so uh, probably uh, the uh, one comment to start for weaning, uh, most of us will have uh, difficulty in identifying the time point when to wean. At what point in time uh, you start weaning a child who is already on ventilator. So uh, most of uh, the experienced people would uh, say you start weaning when you initiate ventilation on a particular child. So for example, when uh, Dr. Rosina discussed the case, so in a child with pneumonia and septic shock, what is the natural timeline of recovery you expect with antibiotics the child would recover in three to four days? So that is when probably you start uh, weaning. And of course, daily assessment is quite useful. And as far as possible, daily morning assessment. And if the child is ready, probably an SBT, uh, which the settings Dr. Rojna has described, uh, which would help in... Uh, uh, early identification of extubation time points. And the modes which we can use for uh, spontaneous breathing trial, when a child has come to a setting like, let's say 15 uh, peak inspiratory pressure, four or five of uh, uh, PEEP and 30 to 40% FiO2, then uh, when you identify whether uh, we need to initiate SBT or not, and then proceeding with extubation, Probably two things you can uh, assess in every child. One, ability of the child to have spontaneous breathing. That means after stopping sedation, neuromuscular agent, whether his spontaneous breathing efforts are good enough to maintain without an assistance from ventilator. And second, ability to maintain airway. After you pull out the tube, whether the child is conscious enough to handle his own secretions, he is uh, able to maintain a patent airway or not. So for that, again, she has highlighted a GCS more than 13 and uh, several prerequisites and uh, uh, absence of edema or presence of a cuff leak, which again, not uh, routinely followed even in our unit. But if you have intubated the child with cuff, cuffed endotracheal tube and uh, during spontaneous breathing trial or before extubation, you release the cuff pressure and assess what amount of tidal volume is leaking in the expiratory tidal volume. So the difference between inspiratory tidal volume and expiratory tidal volume, if it is roughly about, uh, let's say 10% or about 10, 15%, then probably it's a, a decent amount of leak. Then you may be able to extubate without an airway obstruction. Again, it is not foolproof, but you can follow this uh, as a surrogate for airway edema. And the steroid she has highlighted, uh, we can, uh, we generally use in our unit, children uh, who are ventilated for uh, let's say 72 hours or more than that, we tend to use steroids, uh, one or two doses before extubation. And uh, uh, I think uh, rest of the things are uh, well covered. The re-intubation rate, uh, although it was wide, uh, about uh, three to 30%, generally uh, what intensivists accept is roughly around uh, five to 9%. So reduce it to less than 10%. Too low a reintubation rate is also not good. That means that you are very conservative in extubating. So if you extubate 10 children, probably uh, uh, one may get reintubated. That's acceptable. And uh, you probably aim for around 10% or little less than 10%. And the point about heart disease and small infants, uh, very important. Uh, they are the uh, most common uh, risk group where uh, extubation failure is quite common. So uh, as uh, most often uh, as a practice, we generally extubate them to NIV, as you have highlighted in your conclusion. 
so they are uh, already a, a risk group so generally when we tend to extubate them on a high flow nasal cannula or a nasal uh, cpap or bipap uh, to prevent a uh, uh, higher risk of reintubation so these are uh, my some of the comments based on your presentation and then we can discuss the questions probably later on thank you thank you so much sir thank you so much for adding your valuable points in this regard uh, next i would like to invite dr bipul kumar sir uh, just to add your point in uh, winning from ventilator presentation sir yeah thank you uh, for your invitation and uh, actually i am sick at, at this moment so so my uh, voice is not clear will may not be clear so uh, very nicely presented by rosina and she highlighted most of the part and initial part though i have missed but whatever i have uh, uh, gathered the knowledge and she has presented very nicely so uh, for me uh, the regarding uh, winning up from ventilator so there are three parts of ventilation basically one is your acute phase during acute phase number two is your recovery phase number three is your winning when the patient is in acute phase will not start uh, winning so we'll uh, try to extubate or start winning when the patient is in recovery phase daily and it is assessed by the clinician uh, who is taking care of the patient so daily we'll have to look for the patient and before that uh, there are few criteria uh, which to be fulfilled uh, for extubation um, uh, likely uh, for uh, what reason the patient was intubated basically that should be corrected patient should be hemodynamically stable patient gcs should be minimum 11 more than 11 or she has mentioned 13 so it is more than uh, minimum should be 11 and power should be okay and uh, reflexes calf reflexes should be intact uh, so that she, uh, the patient can clear the airways and uh, so after that when the patient is fit for that and then we can go for trial and so uh, and she, has, she has mentioned about the uh, the gastric uh, the stomach should be empty for at least 6 hours for to 6 hours minimum and then uh, calf, that calf tube should be deflated and uh, pe- and the patient's other ventilator setting should be minimum so minimum if how to less than 50% 30% 40% 50% 50% and uh, should be around 4 to 5 6 and then um, that uh, total pip should be less than 20 uh, so that we can uh, go for extubation uh, trial so after extubation uh, so we can go for extubation readiness trial we can go from simb gradually decreasing and the patient's minute ventilation should be provided minimum should be provided 20% uh, that should be uh, around 20% should be provided by the ventilator in that case we can go for the uh, extubation trial and or we can go for spontaneous uh, that uh, ventilation and with minimum peep sometimes or then we can go for pp is ventilation and then if the patient maintains then we can go for extubation so post extubation sometimes there are few problems like she has mentioned uh, rightly most commonly that is a post extubation uh, stridor is very common and sometimes there may be aspiration if it is that uh, gastric uh, that say 6 hours time is not followed or sometimes uh, there may be bronchospasm sometimes there may be laryngospasm these are the problems which can be handled by careful uh, plan extubation so always there may there may be some sort of uh, extubation failure whenever you ex- uh, extubate because uh, already my previous speaker he has rightly mentioned that um, if it is in, in your unit the extubation failure is very very low that means you are too conservative to uh, extubate so always there will be a, some amount of extubation failure will be there from 5 to 30% like that so around uh, 6% in plan extubation also uh, extubation failure is that is around 6% so uh, there will be and so extubation so in case of patients like young patients like prolonged ventilation neuromuscular diseases patient with uh, prolonged respiratory dysfunction in those cases likelihood of having uh, extubation failure is very high so in the, those cases we can put the patient on cpap or uh, high flow nasal cannula or sometimes in older person we can go for bipap so uh, regarding uh, dex- dexamethasone used in case of uh, plan extubation so that those is slightly she has mentioned uh, in a higher dose probably uh, so it is around 0.2 to high to high point 5 mg so four doses is really used uh, at least 12 hours before uh, starting the uh, planning uh, plan extubation and should be used uh, around four doses are used uh, sometimes before extubation four doses can be give, given so uh, re- regarding uh, this uh, helium and oxygen combination i have never used this heliox 
So, but uh, that helps. It is said it helps uh, in uh, upper wear, decreasing the upper wear resistance. But uh, I have never experienced of uh, using this clear. So, others part she has uh, very rightly mentioned about all the things uh, beautifully. So, thank you, Rojina, for your presentation. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Uh, here, purpose of inviting our invitees from the different hospital is like that only. We also wanted to hear the different practices which different hospital are doing. And I think it, this platform is correctly that we are getting a, a different idea from the different facility. And I also request our participant, if they are doing a little bit differently also, they can share their experience with us because now I have not seen any questions in our chat box and I'm giving permissions to unmute you all so that you know you can unmute yourself and you can keep your queries with us because we have a three persons with us we, who can answer your queries. So I request all the participants to whatever queries you have. I think this one is an important topic so which, uh, which, which you, it's very much needed for you all to know. So any of our participants, if they wanted to ask, please unmute yourself. Now you can unmute yourself and you can keep the query. No, we don't have any. Uh, Dr. Dr. Karthi, I have a question for you. Uh, for for spontaneous breeding uh, trial, no. Well, when you when you uh, do that, do you put the patient on the spontaneous mode on the ventilator? You put them on the TPs only. Yeah, that that's a. Uh, very good question and uh, in fact uh, i would be able to answer uh, uh, better in a year or so because we are currently doing a trial okay. where we uh, uh, put patients on uh, spontaneous mode or a pressure support where okay. you give uh, uh, pip i mean uh, uh, a pressure support plus peep versus cpap cpap that is peep alone versus uh, tps so all three modalities uh, have been used in uh, spontaneous breathing trials in many of the studies and different units use uh, based on their uh, comfort level and uh, experience. What we commonly do in our unit, we use either uh, pressure support or CPAP. So uh, uh, we, we don't uh, generally use TPs because by the time they tolerate either pressure support or CPAP, we, went, we go on to extubate them. And if they need a little bit of support post extubation, we use NIV. So our extubation uh, failure rates did not increase and by not using TPs. So we generally use pressure support yeah. or, or CPAP. Uh, hello. Are we audible? Actually, yeah. because of our network, we got disconnected. Uh, yes, ma'am, you can. Ma'am, you can. You can. Sorry, uh, Dr. Karthi, we, I think we lost our connection right now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, please repeat what you said just now. Yeah. It yeah, yeah. So, so the modalities for using spontaneous breathing trials, all three have been used uh, in the in different units and literature, like both pressure support, CPAP, and TPs. Okay. In in our unit, we commonly use pressure support and CPAP. We don't generally use TPs because once they tolerate uh, either pressure support or CPAP, then we'll extubate them. And there is another uh, good question: How long this SBT has been given? So uh, again, the time varies uh, based on again experience and different uh, um, uh, personal uh, uh, preferences. So in studies also, they used anywhere between 30 minutes to two hours. Mm -hmm. Generally, uh, two hours is the maximum uh, people have used. So in our unit, we use somewhere between one and two hours. And if they tolerate for one to two hours without an increase in work of breathing, and as all your parameters you have uh, highlighted, with a hemodynamic stability and uh, ready for extubation, then we'll plan for extubation. Uh, what is the pressure support that you normally give in this uh, children? Oh, so it's uh, uh, generally the PEEP would be around uh, uh, four to five and uh, anything above uh, PEEP seven to eight. So total, it will be around 12 to 13 of uh, uh, pressure. top pressure. Yeah. Okay. And then one more question I have, like what about your take on uh, 
tracheostomy. Suppose if we have intubated a child either for a neuromuscular or even for respiratory support or like a child with encephalitis, uh, what is your uh, take or your uh, protocol that you follow when you decide to give the child and uh, start to do tracheostomy? Yeah, again, uh, an important question, but uh, probably uh, we will not be able to cover the entire prolonged weaning here. I think Dr. Bipul has mentioned uh, while weaning the stages of weaning. So when uh, a child is where you are not able to wean, uh, particularly uh, uh, beyond a certain period of time, again, the time varies. Uh, if you see adults, they tend to do uh, tracheostomy early, but in children, we generally wait. Like, uh, for example, I would give you a, a, a LGBS child, a child with Guillain-Barre syndrome, who has been ventilated. Uh, generally, they require ventilation anywhere between one to four weeks in our unit. So at the end of uh, around uh, two weeks, we uh, evaluate the child for ability to maintain airway. Like if he still has uh, poor gag reflex and not able to handle his secretion, we, uh, uh, we tend to do tracheostomy and then wean them further. Similarly, children with encephalitis who has come out of the acute phase, but still uh, their uh, uh, GCS score has not improved still encephalopathic, but uh, came out of like acute critical uh, condition. Again, we assess for uh, like airway uh, maintenance, uh, possibility of like maintaining spontaneous airway. If that is not feasible, then uh, by end of a, a week to two weeks, we uh, consider them for tracheostomy. Again, it is uh, based on case to case basis. It is difficult to give uh, uh, kind of a protocolized guidelines. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Karthi. Dr. Bipul, do you want to comment on uh, on this? Uh, yes. So usually, uh, tracheostomy is try to we do try to avoid tracheostomy, but at the same time, we'll have to look for the uh, problems of uh, intubation also. So whenever uh, we expect a patient to have uh, prolonged ventilation. So usually at around 10, 12, after 10 and 10 to 12 days, so we uh, think about the uh, requirement of uh, tracheostomy. So if the patient, suppose if we uh, presume that, that this patient might come out in another four to five days or we might uh, uh, avoid having to go for uh, tracheostomy because sometimes tracheostomy, again, to uh, close tracheostomy closer is difficult later on. And there are sometimes incidents of having some tracheostomy uh, problems also and patient uh, had some uh, problems uh, after having tracheostomy. So that's why uh, we'll have to assess individually in all patients, but around at around at the end of two weeks, we can think of having tracheostomy uh, to, to go for tracheostomy, but uh, we'll have to adjust according to the patient's condition. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Any other question? Okay. Yeah. Nanika can take the question from here. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, I have a few queries from our participant, like uh, Dr. Birender, sir, have asked, like, could you please elaborate on sedation hardly dip protocol? That was already covered in one session. Huh? Okay. Uh, Dr. Bipul, sir, or Dr. Karthi, sir, any one of you would like to answer this question, sir? So uh, regarding uh, sedation holidays or that is regarding uh, mus uh, neuromuscular blockage, uh, stoppage of uh, blockage. So whenever in the patient is in the recovery stage, when we plan for extubation in the morning time, so uh, we plan for extubation, plan extubation. During that time, we usually uh, try to avoid the previous dose of uh, that uh, sedative, uh, sedative drugs or sedation or neuromuscular drugs so that we can uh, assess properly the uh, activity of the patient. Usually, normally before extubation to uh, go for extubation readiness trial, the patient should have normal strength. Normal strength means the patient should be at least uh, moving his all limbs properly, and uh, at least the power should be more than three by five. More than three by five. That means the patient should at least uh, have a movement against the gravity. So, uh, if we use sedation or neuromuscular agents, in that case, uh, we cannot assess properly regarding the readiness of uh, extubation uh, in those patients. So, uh, we should go for uh, at least uh, uh, the night before. We can stop that morning dose also uh, so that we can assess properly. 
and in between the age the patient is very violent or sometimes younger patient is difficult we can again put the patient on sedation uh, after assessing the patient thank you sir uh, and then another question is asked by bharti ma'am like how long we will give spontaneous breathing trial okay. answer has been given by karthik sir so I, i i will just read out it Spontaneous breathing trial is given for thirty minutes to two hour, and then here also different unit use a different timing. And I think in sir area sir is using giving uh, for one hour. I think Bharti ma'am, you got your answer. Okay. Uh, and ah uh, last one question is like, uh, what happened in case of difficult or failed intubations? Dr. Karthik sir, you want to answer this one? So, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, despite your best efforts, some children will uh, fail your uh, extubation trial. So again, at the time of uh, like when you assess the child has failed extubation, which uh, may manifest in form of either increasing work of breathing or not able to maintain airway or an upper airway obstruction. So to differentiate these two uh, is uh, very useful because if it is strider. and uh, um, upper airway obstruction so you intubate with a small tube and uh, wait for the edema to resolve so probably you can restart dexamethasone if um, if you have already not given give dexamethasone and wait for 24 to 48 hours and uh, try extubation again this is for upper airway obstruction if the child is uh, the child has failed extubation because of um, um, respiratory failure or uh, increased work of breathing requiring again assistance so at, uh, in those children probably you may try an nme first if that works if it is not working intubate and put him on uh, pulse support like in same or whatever uh, ventilation protocol of your unit and look for the cause for uh, failed extubation so why the child developed worsening uh, respiratory distress or had uh, failed extubation so many a times simple reasons like fluid overload where you need to use a little bit of diuretics and uh, uh, reduce the uh, uh, extra vascular lung water and uh, again try extubation or the primary disease is not resolved when you have uh, probably assessed and uh, thought that it has resolved but probably the pneumonia is uh, not resolved or a secondary infection a secondary uh, uh, probably hospital acquired uh, or ventilator associated pneumonia so the, you assess the reason for it and treat the cause and then try extubation again so uh, this is uh, the general way of uh, proceeding and some children repeated failure again uh, a case to case basis you can think about uh, tracheostomy that is uh, probably a different case scenario uh thank you so much uh, another question is asked by dafisha like have you ever incubated a microgantia be uh, incubated a micronatia baby or If, if yes, yes, yes did you succeed so we here we have intubated uh, dr rosina here for dafisha we have intubated patient with micrognathia especially those with peri robin sequence it is difficult but is not is not impossible okay you have to uh, probably try back the patient some more and then uh, intubate the child so we have uh, two we had two just uh, last month we we intubated and they were ventilated also for some time so we have intubated If you don't succeed again, just uh, try. You know, just uh, oxygenate the baby properly and try again. Thank you, ma'am. And one last uh, question is asked by Jennifer: Like, is nebulizations with bronchodilator or with the normal saline recommended for pediatric post extubation? So, these questions I would like to forward to Dr. Bipul sir. Okay, uh, for post extubation, uh, that's tried or. that can be minimized by doing giving uh, nebulization with epinephrine that means uh, racemic epinephrine or normal epinephrine so we can go for uh, rep post uh, to minimize the post extubation uh, strider and that will decrease the edema of that uh, airways and that will decrease the uh, post extubation strider but sometimes we have complications of uh, having bronchospasm post extubation bronchospasm and uh, those children who are having reactive airway disease previously or had uh, or is known asthmatic so those children they are more prone to develop post extubation uh, this uh, uh, bronchospasm so uh, by giving uh, beta adrenergic uh, agonist uh, salbutamol inhalation so we can nebulization we can uh, do that so in sometimes uh, there may be thick secretions or in that case that normal saline nebulization or 
I bet sometimes the three percent solution nebulization can help, but otherwise, no, epinephrine uh, nebulization is uh, recommended routinely, and that helps. And in case of bronchospasm, we can go for uh, inhalation of uh, bronchospasm with adrenergic agonist. We can go for that. Thank you so much, Dr. Bipul. Uh, Dr. Karthi, you want to say, uh, tell your answer to the audience? I, I think Dr. Bipul has explained clearly. That's the same thing which we also follow. Okay. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Patrick, sir, and um, Dr. Bipul, sir. So now I would like to start our second presentation, which will be presented by Dr. Arun. And I would like to request both our invitees to stay back so that again after the uh, next session also we'll have a discussion. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. I think hope uh, our PPT is visible. Uh, yes. Yes. Doctor, doctor, you can. Yes. You don't want this one. Yes, you are not able to say anyone. Is it okay? It's okay. <laughs> Good evening, I'm Dr. Arun John. Thank you for this opportunity. After an extensive session on uh, weaning of a ventilator, let's go into electrolyte imbalance in PICU. So, how to go with the next? So uh, outline, I'm going to talk about sodium and potassium and they, it's mainly, it's mainly going to be about uh, sodium and potassium and their uh, imbalance. What is the etiology and understand the pathophysiology be, uh, between the each and different etiologies, how to recognize them and manage them. What is the most common risk electrolytemia in PICU? PICU. Okay, it's hyponatremia. So now let's go on to an approach based, and we are just going to be direct. If you find this, you're going to do this. Okay. So clinical approach to this electrolytemia. So this electrolytemia, when are you going to anticipate what kind of this electrolytemia is going to be there? So you have a child with diarrhea, you're going to anticipate a hyponatremia or hypernatremia or hypokalemia. If you have a DKI child, you can have hypernatremia or hyponatremia or hypokalemia or hyperkalemia. Whereas in CNS disorder, it is mainly going to be a hyponatremia. And how to suspect when there is this electrolytemia happening, you are, uh, you are managing a case or you know a natural cause of a disease, right? And when something is getting deviated, and that's when you suspect, when you find a uh, pneumonia child recovering, but uh, morning you find he is lethargic, he is not responding to you. So first thing you have to think is some electrolyte imbalance is happening. So in a CNS cardiac or musculoskeletal syndrome, sign that does not fit to the natural evaluation of the basic illness the child is having. So approach to hyponatremia. So what we are going to do is, first you are going to do blood tests. So you got some symptoms and you, 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 okay, you think the child is in water, if the child is somewhere, you got some symptoms and you are going to do tests and uh, sodium level comes less than 135. And it does not mean that the blood sodium is really 135. There could be some sampling error also. Sometimes if the sample is just collected proximal to the hypotonic saline uh, infusion area, like suppose half DNA is going on, and just proximal to that it is collected, you will get a falsely low uh, value. And there is something called uh, factitious, like in a DKA child with an every uh, change in glucose of 100 uh, milligram per deciliter from the baseline of 100, uh, you need to add 1.6 milliequivalents of sodium to the what sodium you got. So this is mainly for the DKA children. And after doing all this, and you uh, have ruled out this one not there, and you need to say whether it is a true hyponatremia. So true hyponatremia will always have low osmolarity. 
and next is for, before going into management and mm -hmm. i need to emphasize here that not all hyponatremias are sodium deficient and uh, 3% nacl is the drug of choice it is not like that it is like it is not that all fever is deficient of uh, <laughs> the so i hope it is clear it is not like that so we need to assess the volume status to classify them and manage them accordingly so next how will you assess the volume status see volume in a body is distributed in different small small membranes like intracellular fluid and in extracellular also there is some uh, interstitial fluid there is an intravascular fluid there is transcellular fluid so let's see how to assess them and the main thing you need to find is whether they are deficient or in excess okay so interstitial fluid deficient will be manifesting as a loss of skin turgor which you uh, mainly see in uh, diarrhea children and excess is pitting edema uh, basal rays where because alveolar uh, space spaces also an interstitium and you get this uh, wheeze if this edema is happening in the uh, airway and uh, intravascular volume depletion this is a, a classical shock himesh sir has already spoken about this in detail i'll just tell a uh, superficial things the classical signs are like those tachycardia decreased peripheral pulse prolonged crt postural hypertension these are signs of deficit if it is excess same what will happen the jvp will be rise hepato jugular reflux will be present there will be uh, you know rise in the bp so rise in the bp again it's an important uh, finding here so next is uh, transcellular body fluid so here the deficit these are uh, basically uh, the serosal spaces we can say it will be dry mouth and the decreased tear shrunken eyes excess or ascites and pleural effusion so this is how you assess for the volume status after assessing for the volume status you classify the child uh, volume status whether it is hypovolemic isovolemic or hypervolemic so hypovolemic is uh, almost always sodium loss so it, the sodium loss is happening either in the through renal or it is happening through uh, extra renal symptoms so renal you are using diuretics or any uh, tubular sodium loss in uh, acute tubular necrosis or you know or a polyuric phase of uh, 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 so all this time you will have renal sorry sorry i just take it give me a second just okay thank you okay so uh now in renal uh, the child is whether the child is on diuretics or if you have any uh, renal injury happening and in a cns case cerebral salt wasting uh, syndrome where you have a shock and the sodium is getting lost and your sodium is not picking up whatever 3% you give so that time you suspect a, in a cns hemorrhage or meningitis tumor so cerebral salt wasting and the condition where the aldosterone is reduced and the uh, clue it is not necessary if you it goes in periphery so you are just starting you don't have urine sodium it, and it is mainly clinical and your examination uh, you you need not uh, do a uh, urine sodium to uh, you know confirm your diagnosis or something it is only a clinical based because at the end the uh, treatment is going to be the uh, uh, same so extra renal loss like you find there is uh, vomiting diarrhea or if the child is on ng tube and there's a continuous drain happening 200 300 uh, per day so those things significant amount of uh, volume will be lost and uh, sodium chloride also will be lost and uh, in skin it is because of uh, heat loss and touch spacing in sepsis or burn so the Clue is again history examination, and here what happens? The kidneys are good. The kidneys are knowing that oh, body is not having sodium, so I will through a RAS mechanism, it will uh, conserve the so, uh, urinary sodium, and the urinary sodium will be typically less than ten. Isovolumic is the classical example is uh, SIADH. Hypervolemia is associated with sodium retention. The causes are CCF, cirrhosis, in nephrotic syndrome. Nephrotic syndrome, not all nephrotic syndrome. The, uh, there are, uh, you know, you assess the volume status again. Hypervolemic state of nephrotic syndrome, they, they can have hyponatremia. And again, the clue is history examination. And here also, the kidneys are normal. The sodium is conserved. Okay. So now, why you need to worry about hyponatremia? 
So this is why the brain and sodium are closely related. And uh, anything you do uh, wrong, gross in an acute uh, phase, it, that will damage the brain. So how it is going to damage, and it is going to be a permanent damage. So what is going to happen? Uh, we all know that uh, wherever salt is there, water goes. Okay, even we also we eat uh, something salty, we feel like drinking water. We eat some uh, noodles or biryani, you know, we feel like drinking water. So wherever salt is there, water goes over there. So uh, imagine in an equilibrium state, the water is uh, just in the brain cells and in the intravascular area. So if we are going to suddenly reduce or some pathology is reducing the salt, so water what it does, it sees that, okay, here the osmolality is like, because salt contributes to the osmolality. So osmolality is less. I, I need not stay here. Someone is pulling me inside. So the cells start to swell because the brain also has some uh, amount of uh, uh, osmols. So that will start to pull the water. When it starts to pull the water, the brain swells. And when the brain swells, you know, the brain is a tight, uh, it's in a tight compartment, only CSF, blood flow and brain. So when the brain swells, the uh, intracranial pressure rises. So when the intracranial pressure rises, the symptoms will be lethargy, confusion, muscle cramps, weakness, she seizures and coma, the late uh, finding. So you you have to uh, identify the child who is becoming, uh, he was uh, all, all like fine and suddenly you find him becoming uh, lethargic. You need to uh, really uh, uh, pick up the hyponatremia clinically and then send for the investigations and uh, watch for it. And there are some conditions where the child is uh, chronically uh, having this hyponatremia problem. Okay, like uh, the child is uh, cerebral salt wasting uh, syndrome child who is like having this hyponatremia problem for a long time. So in this child, what happens? The brain has adopted, the brain has reduced the synthesis of its osmol and it has adopted so that the brain is also not getting swell. The body is also not getting, uh, you know, uh, dehydrated, it is getting maintained. But the child comes to you, you find that oh, sodium is very low, I'm going to correct it. So you're going to rapidly increase the uh, blood sodium level, and that is going to increase the osmolality. So wherever sodium is there, water goes. So from the brain, where the adaptation has happened and it is less, the water starts to shift out. So here what happens, the cells start to shrink. So this shrinkage, that shrinkage due to intracellular dehydration is called as uh, myeli no lysis. So the cells are just getting this one and the main area going to be affected is spontane. So it is central pontine myelinolysis. So next is the general principles of management of hyponatremia. So the basic strategy is it is going to be based on the presence or absence of symptoms and the duration of hyponatremia and the volume status of the patient. Okay. So now presence and absence of symptoms. First, what symptom you're going to mainly look for? It is a seizure and coma. So when you have seizure and coma and you're getting a hyponatremia, you know there is a setting for hyponatremia. You immediately, if you're not able to do a blood analysis simulated, do an ABG or you already have a high suspicion that, okay, this child is going to develop hyponatremia. You must immediately uh, build up the uh, sodium level in the body so that the blood the water from the brain comes out, the intracerebral pressure reduces. So that's how we need to treat the symptomatic patients. You need an acute rise. So how do you do that? 3% NACL, 2 to 3 millicoulombs per kg, IV over 30 to 60 minutes. So this is uh, nothing but 2 to 3 ml per kg, IV over 30 to 60 minutes. This will raise the uh, blood uh, sodium level for three, so every one ml per kg of 3% NACL is going to rise one milli equivalents uh, per liter or millimole per liter. The uh, values are same, it is just going to rise one. Okay. And uh, this, uh, so when you give two to three milli equivalent, two to three uh, ml per kg, what happens? Your osmolality rises by five. Okay. So, the, and by this, the water shifts back again to the intravascular space, the edema in the brain reduces, and the symptoms will resolve. So uh, how severe the symptom is, that much rapid you have to give. And once the symptom is resolved, so symptom resolved, he has gone to an asymptomatic phase now. Okay. Don't push on, don't keep on giving 3% again. Once the symptom is resolved, he has gone to an asymptomatic phase. Now his rate of rise should be 0 0.3 to 0 0.4 milli per liter per hour. 
So this is basically uh, for the asymptomatic correction, what you're going to do. It is like for acute, you're going to correct 10 to 12 milli per liter in 24 hours. And for the chronic, it is going to be much slower, eight to 10 milli per liter in 24 hours. So uh, you are going back to that uh, previous correction. And this correction depends on the child's volume status, child's background condition. It, you're not going to correct it with 3% uh, initial, depending on this uh, background condition you're going to correct. I hope this is uh, clear. Now, hypovolemic hyponatremia. What are the conditions when you get a GI loss like diarrhea, vomiting, you, you're getting a child with sepsis, burns, and or uh, 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 diuretics, or uh, DKA patient, or you, uh, some manitol is given for uh, you know, reducing the rice ISP or some condition. So you're, the child has lost volume also, okay? And child has lost sodium also. Here, what has... has been more than the sodium loss, okay? But water has lost in these conditions because all these conditions, uh, it is a hypotonic solution which is going to go, okay? So the water loss is more than the sodium loss. And here what happens, the ADH is being stimulated due to hypovolemia. So ADH is nothing but anti-diuretic hormone. Its main function is to preserve the free water from the kidneys. And its main stimulus Less volume is less, so ADH will be secreted. So these are physiological secretion of ADH, which will happen in these conditions. You know, it is going to happen, whatever you do or not. It is a physiological thing. It is going to happen, and that is going to lead to free water retention, leading to further hyponatremia because it is only going into full free water, not the sodium. Okay. So we cannot let this happen for the child continuously. So what we need to do in hypovolemic hyponatremia, this hypovolemia is the first term, and we need to correct that. What we need to do is we need to correct the shock. So Himeshar has spoken about this correction of shock. First thing is we need to correct the shock. When we correct the shock, attain an volumic state, this ADH secretion stops. When this ADH secretion stops, free water absorption sh stops. And by this process only, the, some amount of hyponatremia will be corrected. And uh, as such, you're going to give some specific therapy also. For example, diarrhea, you're going to give ORS. And based on the category, you know, uh, plan A, plan B, plan C, you know, WHO you're going to give. So uh, for everything, there is a specific therapy you're going to do. And always remember, follow the general principles of hyponatremia management. So just to review back, what is the general principle of hyponatremia? I think uh, presence or absence of symptom is the first strategy. And you always look during the symptomatic phase, give bolus, rise, and make the child asymptomatic and rise it slowly. So hypovolemia, hyponatremia, you're going to identify by history, you know the pathophysiology, shut the ADH down by restoring the volume and uh, look for the uh, sodium correction and treat the cause. Next is euvolemic hyponatremia. So euvolemic hyponatremia, this condition, they don't present to you with euvolemic hypernatremia usually, otherwise, you, unless otherwise you're in a tertiary care center where the injury has happened a week ago. This usually happens three, four days later after injury or, uh, you know, support. So here, what is happening is, in these conditions, pneumonia, positive pressure ventilation, CNS injury, or there is post-op pain, and on top of that, uh, somehow someone has given a hypotonic solution, or just even RL also is now becoming a hypotonic solution, and the child has gone to fuel overload. And there are stressors, like even a fever is stressor, a pain is a stressor, so child in ICU, separated from parents, it's a stressor. So, so many stressors are there, okay? So, all these stressors, it'll cause, it'll cause secretion of ADH. This ADH is not related to the osmolality or to the volume. It is to the other stressors and disease. So this is a, not an appropriate secretion. That's why it is called as syndrome of inappropriate ADH. Okay. Uh, uh, 
secretion of uh, in the uh, SADH, uh, syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion. Okay, so here what is happening? High ADH, it is inappropriate. Whereas you see the total body body sodium is normal. See when you measure the sodium, it will show low. That is why we are talking about hyponatremia in SADH. But if you see the total body sodium, it is normal. So what is happening? This ADH is causing free water uh, reabsorption and dilutional hyponatremia. Simple. So it is it is all around this ADH. So now what we can do, how to shut this ADH? So before that, you need to diagnose SA ADH because here you're going to give some treatment which may which is totally opposite to the hypovolemic hyponatremia. So you must first label the diagnosis, pin it down and write the treatment. So for that diagnostic criteria, so first is true hyponatremia. What is you have to show is, so serum sodium is going to be low and the osmolality also will reduce. And second thing is, so this free water which is getting absorbed, it will never cause uh, obvious fluid overload. Okay, it will just keep your BP in a little bit higher side like that. You won't, it won't cause a pulmonary edema. It won't cause size JVP, and there is no dehydration going to be present. And next is, uh, this ADH is going to act on the kidneys, remove the free water. No, so when the free water is being removed, the urine becomes heavily concentrated. You know, the color of the urine. You put this, the color of the urine. All these days, it will be coming nice, uh, transparent or yellow. It will start to become highly concentrated, very dark in color. And when you measure the sodium will be more than 20. And on top of that, the renal function, thyroid function, adrenal and pituitary function should be normal. Okay, So you need not do the blood test for all these things. And uh, usually with the clinical uh, scenario and with the volume status and with the serum level, uh, you can uh, diagnose SAADH with the history in background. Okay, So now treatment of SAADH is in asymptomatic patients, just restrict the fluid to one third to two third of the maintenance, make and provide adequate calories during this time. Uh, already the child is in a stress or and catabolic state is increased. So provide adequate calories, but restrict the fluid to one third to two third of the maintenance and you observe. But uh, see, still it is not uh, improving. You know, it is becoming severe. Like it is the sodium level is becoming less than 120 like that. And uh, you know, still it is due to SADH. Okay, so here you need to reduce the free water. So you start using uh, furosemide on top of fluid restriction. Okay, and uh, next is, and here you are not going to give a hypotonic solution or something. You are going to give an isotonic solution. Whatever fluid you are going to give, or if it is a feed, it's a feed. If it's a fluid, it's going to be isotonic fluid. Okay, and uh, if the child becomes symptomatic, you are going to give three percent NaCl bolus. So that that basic is clear. You know, if any time during hyponatremia, if symptomatic, you are going to give a bolus and bring back the child. Okay. Next is hypovolemic hyponatremia. Uh, here it is this hypovolemic hyponatremia. The hypervolemia is going to cause a problem to you, not the hyponatremia. Okay. So what is usually happening like in nephrotic syndrome? You have a hypervolemic state and cardiac failure, renal failure, cirrhosis. All this condition, the effective circulatory volume is reduced. So meaning here, what I want to tell is there is volume here, but all this volume has been uh, gone to some uh, third spacing, you know, uh, low protein has gone to interstitial space, high pressure and cardiac failure. It has gone to interstitial space. So the intravascular volume is affected. The volume going to the kidneys are affected. So this will activate the RAS system and that will again, uh, you know, conserve the sodium and water. So that will lead to hyponatremia. So here the hyponatremia is mild usually asymptomatic and non-progressive. Okay, so what you will do here, here again, for all these conditions and nephrotic syndrome with the hypervolemia, you know, not all nephrotic, keep in mind, with the hypervolemic state, you find restrict fluid and give specific therapy, support the heart and the renal, you want to do renal replacement, do renal replacement. So you have to do specific therapy and the things will improve. And here again, 3% NACL is not going to be the therapy unless or until if there is a severe, you know, he can develop uh, this when he starts to develop diarrhea, you know, if, if he is going into hypovolemic state, it may become severe. As such, a pure hypervolemic hyponatremia, it is very, very rare to go to a severe hyponatremia. Next is which of the following leads to brain injury? So, we were talking about brain injuries. I thought I'll just put some uh, MCQ in. Uh, first one is acute, that is less than 48 hours, severe sodium imbalance. So, here what I mean to say is within 48 hours, there is Sodium imbalance of brain is going to less than 120, it's going to more than 160. Is it going to lead to a brain injury? Or second one, rapid correction of chronic clinically stable sodium imbalance. So a child is fine, chronically sodium imbalance, but you just see and you try to correct it very rapidly. And chronic meaning more than 48 hours. So even a three day of 
hyponatremia you find a child referring from you from somewhere hyponatremia is documented he has reached you on the day 3 and you have hyponatremia it has become chronic the brain has got idiogenic osmosis and you have to correct it slowly so and is it going to lead to a brain damage if you are going to correct it fast and the third point is you are not going to do any correction if the patient has become symptomatic with 3% nacl is it going to lead to a brain damage so what i want to emphasize is all of the above is going to lead to brain damage and it is going to be a permanent brain damage permanent sequelae you treat the condition he will recover from pneumonia he will recover from uh, he'll come extubated but he'll have a permanent brain damage you know the brain damage can be to an extent of uh, he may be uh, totally immobile or to a subtle cognitive or a max uh, in performance he will be performing in school after the disease he will go because probably this would have led him to some brain uh, damage next we will see hypernatremia by definition hypernatremia is 145 millimol per liter so see millimol per liter and milli equivalents per liter what is the difference okay if you take sodium and potassium where it is like you know 1 plus sodium na plus k plus it is the same so when the difference is going to happen is if it is calcium 2 plus so if we are going to going to get a value of 1.5 millimol per liter of calcium then it is equal to 2 milli equivalents per liter okay so since we are just sticking on to sodium and potassium no need to confuse so you just think don't get confused that is some books written milli equivalents millimol it is the same millimol per liter milli equivalents per liter it is the same okay and hypernatremia in pico setting it is frequently hydrogenic and uh, uh, second thing is salt intake or administration uh, which is usually accidental and it's uh, uh, very accidental uh, next is increased insensible water loss so this will be in premature infant radian worm and uh, the le for the baby does not cause but if you set up have the bulb yellow bulb light which will produce lots of heat and there will be a lots of insensible water loss happening and ineffective uh, feeding you know in newborn day 3 old baby developing fever you take back his steam proper feeding is there and that again you know dehydration uh, fever you will have a hypernatremia happening over there and the other conditions are like diabetes insipidus where the insipidus diabetes insipidus that means only water is going out you know again hypernatremia water and sodium is set in diarrhea see hypovolemic hyponatremia also diarrhea hypernatremia also in diarrhea why because in diarrhea if the child child will have thirst but you are not allowing access to drink water okay then the child will go into hypernatremic uh, blood finding otherwise a diarrhea child who is otherwise usually in diarrhea they dilute things and give and everything so the, the usually the diarrhea will present with hypovolemic hypernatremia he can still present with hypernatremia but uh, only if there is no access or unable to drink water he has become so severe so fast and he is unable to drink water he will present with hypernatremia so that we have to keep in mind and why to worry about hypernatremia so here what happens again this conditions are you know acute so when there is acute rise in the sodium or uh, sodium in the blood so now the sodium is calling water i need water uh, intracellular uh, fluid you have water and I, i'm more stronger than you i have more osmolality you send some water so it will take the water away from intracellular and what happened the cells start to shrink so this cell brain shrinks and what happened when brain shrinks all the brain will shrink the bridging vessels you know in anatomy you would have seen the diploid vessel bridging vessel starts to tear and hemorrhage you know, that will lead to seizure and coma it's, it's also very uh, dangerous condition now hypovolemic hypernatremia so if you are going to uh, get a child which is not hydrogenic and uh, coming with a hypovolemic uh, state like diarrhea hypovolemic state and you find the dowy skin you know see uh, dowy skin is when you are uh, having this state what is the happening is your cells are having water but the capillaries in between are not having water you know so when you press you know when you are going to when you are making maida chapati when you actually press you feel that dowy feel you no know? those uh, kerala parotta those feel you no know? so those kind of feel you will get when you are uh, going to uh, uh, you know feel for the skin you know when you are going to press and see so that dowy feel you will get because and and when you are going to get this dowy feel remember this is going to be the last stage you know what happens is excessive loss of hypotonic fluid with insufficient water intake this is a background going to be there what happened water loss has happened more than the sodium right we understood this now water loss from the intracellular fluid is called we saw first what is that called dehydration so water from the intracellular compartment is called dehydration and 
this water has gone where it has gone to the intravascular compartment to maintain blood flow to the vital organs and still you do not uh, provide enough uh, you know uh, water you do not provide enough uh, supplements what happens the child will land up into shock so later leads to shock so when you get a dowy skin you should be very careful the child will sooner lead to shock and sooner uh, have a uh, collapse or develop multi organ dysfunction next treatment of hypovolemic hyponatremia so if uh, we are going to understand what we are going to do we will not miss so what i am going to do is i am going to put in steps what are our concerns how we are going to treat the concern and what is the reason behind the treatment okay so first is step 1 shock see this shock is a big term himesh sir has spoken extensively about that so i am going to tell in a uh, smaller way 0.9% normal saline bolus rate and volume depends on the clinical status okay and uh, next is if you don't correct the shock in first you are going to correct okay i'll correct this i'll correct this you know patient will die with shock there is no point chasing the step 2 step 3 step 4 so go in step so after correcting shock go to the step 2 now here more water has been lost than the sodium so that's what we are seeing you know so what we need to do we need to give more free water than the sodium so how are we going to give this there are two ways one is there are formulas to do that you can follow for the, those formulas so jitra uh, or nelson says there are uh, this this method which i am telling is from uh, nelson okay so both give similar result but the most important thing is the trend of the sodium you give formula based or uh, formula means the, there is like 4 ml into weight into uh, what is your desired sodium difference you know so those formulas are there but the main thing is trend of sodium so remember to repeat if needed after 4 hours or after 6 hours you find deteriorating repeat after 1 hour 2 hours so you know those trend is very important okay now let's continue how are we going to correct this 0.45% of normal saline we know this is an hypotonic solution with 5% dextrose with or without kcl okay so here what is there is normally if you take 0.9% this is an isotonic full tone with your body when you are going to give your half the rest half becomes water so you are going to give the free water also through this 0.45 percent stage of normal saline with 5 percent uh, dextrose to mix and give and the rate will be 1.2 to 1.5 times the total fluid requirement based on the holiday sugar formula and the reason i have already told to supplement the free water now and there is going to be ongoing loss so how are we going to replace ongoing loss so if you don't why we need to replace ongoing loss if you don't replace you will again go into the same hypovolemic dehydration yeah? so the step 1 and step 2 becomes waste if you don't do the step 3 so step 3 is you have to replace it volume by volume you know preferably oral replacement uh, ors is a, a better way to replace for diarrhea and there are uh, uh, for if it is polyuria and ng there are uh, you know you can replace with for ng you can replace with uh, normal saline with uh, uh, kcl and for polyuria it is uh, n by 2 with uh, kcl so those things you will get in the book my thing is to understand the concept replace the ongoing loss so frequent monitoring is very important now the rate of correction so the rate of correction is you are going to see 0.6 to 1 millicoulombs per hour if it is more than that then you need to really slow your iv rate so suppose you are giving it at 1.2 never mind come to 1.1 and again recheck you know so the rate of fall because we saw the rate is the one which is going to be very impactful going to cause a brain damage okay to prevent the brain damage and the rate of fall if it is less than 0.05 and we have we can be more liberal in giving the uh, rate you increase the rate it is so simple okay and next and even though after doing this four step very cautiously the child develops cerebral edema or you find too rapid fall you and this and the child is becoming like uh, you know lethargic and symptomatic you give one 3% nacl bring it up and then uh, you reabsorb the water which has gone to the brain and you again uh, assess where you went wrong what you need to do you need to correct your shock you need to go for step 2 step 3 so those things you need to keep in mind this is treatment for hypovolemic hyponatremia and uh, this is like uh, this slide will be shared with you what all i have explained in before i have just put it in a uh, uh, in a in a single site uh, what is the uh, presentation for hyponatremia hyponatremia and only one thing i would like to tell is it is not a spe so specific finding Uh, in hyponatremia the tendon reflex will become depressed in hyponatremia it, it it becomes exaggerated okay and next is hyperkalemia hyperkalemia by definition 5.5 millicoulombs 
per liter okay and see this hyperkalemia before going to the thing i'll tell you one little story okay so uh, this hyperkalemia it is like there are uh, five different people and someone says something okay one person will feel offended one person will say ah, leave it one person will say no no we have to work on it no one person will say okay i'll do it again if i do mistake mistake i'll learn so same way every individual will not respond the same to the same level of uh, uh, no uh, potassium so some will be very sensitive to 5.5 some will be tolerant to 7 also you know so those things individualization but we don't have that time to identify wait and see whether this fellow is good enough to tolerate or not okay so whatever it is so we have a cut off we are going to move for it move forward so before that you need to uh, get to know some things like whether it is a spurious lab value so you find a trend of value coming to you you know 4 3 3.5 and you are not giving any potassium you don't find any uh, you know hemoglobinuria otherwise the child looks fine you find that ecg monitoring also is fine but you get a value of 6 you know you need not go and jump and correct everything you you can repeat the sample you meanwhile you monitor the ecg there could be a squeeze sample happening you know rbc because this potassium is predominantly an intracellular uh, ion you know god has created in such a way you are roaming outside too much then you will hit the heart i'll put you inside so he has put everything inside the thing just regulating with the sodium potassium atp pump so that when we squeeze too much you know the cell lysis happen it comes or if there is any hemolysis going on it will come out okay so all these things the meaning is from the exit point it has become hyperkalemic in vivo that is inside the body it is normal just while exiting it has become so that is the meaning of spurious okay and uh, we need not treat spurious values next and you next you see the uh, actual causes if there is any increase intake or production you see the sometimes you know someone would have started suddenly it is just going on going on we did not notice or it is not labeled in the iv fluid sometimes it happens it is not labeled but uh, heavy dose was started then later the lab report came but still we continued that because it was not labeled we thought it is not there no? so labeling is also i would like to emphasize here it is very important and the other things like uh, oh, giving a old blood transfusion and uh, giving it for quite long or the blood has become uh, you know very uh, warm or it is you know, the blood has come to the ward after 4 5 hours you are going to give so those all things will obviously increase the potassium level second thing is transcellular shift this is a very important mechanism for causing hyperkalemia and for treating hyperkalemia also okay so when there is when there will be transcellular sh shift this potassium it is very sensitive to the ph change so if it is becoming acidotic like for dka child if the child is becoming acidotic then the potassium will come to the blood okay so more acidotic more potassium to the blood okay and the drugs we will see the four important drugs i will see later and in, by telling drugs what i want to say is when you are going to think of hyperkalemia and anything just take some time see the drug content you know sometimes some brand will have potassium hidden uh, so always see the drug uh, content and administer decrease excretion like renal failure or in, uh, renal adrenal disease so here clinical feature is mainly cardiotoxicity other things are like you know paresthesia muscle weakness tingling this all in children it is very difficult to appreciate and if you appreciate also we don't directly attribute to, okay it's hyperkalemia you know we usually think okay if there is any peripheral neuropathy happening or something like that you know so symptoms does not mean the child is no symptom does not mean child is in danger not in danger okay so it does not mean that no symptom no danger okay so what is the next very important thing that we have so here we have some amount of lab and you have some amount of uh, history and some background here the clinical findings features are not of importance so you need a ecg lead where you will have a tall tented t wave you know tall very tall and uh, tented t wave that tall tented t wave it will be more than half of the uh, r wave you know that that becomes significant you need not go for the box you know, if you see in uh, lead 2 if the t wave is more than half of the r wave then to you have to think something is going to happen to the child's heart and we are going to lose if you don't diagnose and treat and the first cause you have to think is hyperkalemia okay medications are like you know amoxiclab very simple routinely prescribed drug have uh, potassium and uh, uh, potassium sparing uh, drugs like you know spironolactone or ace inhibitors and aneuric patient trimethoprim in very high doses you know these are in a very uh, rare usage order i am giving and there are other drugs also which you can go back and uh, read on which 
treatment of hyperkalemia there are two basic goals one is i want to prevent heart attack okay i don't want the heart to go into ventricular fibrillation or i don't want the heart to suffer so first you have to stabilize the heart second thing is you have to remove the potassium from the body and how do i going to do that step step one first stop all sources of uh, additional potassium so make sure your iv fluid don't have if you are really doubting you are not sure whether it is mixed or not change just discard it and take a new one and you, you uh, right no port chloride to be more potassium added and you make sure that no potassium to be added you give handover you know so those emphasize the ground level work should be very strong and second thing is if the potassium level is more than 6.5 you are supposed to do ecg but you know in practical aspect doing an uh, ecg just connecting to the cardiac monitor is is more quicker than the blood level na huh? so uh, sometimes blood level may take one or two hours but this is just you know 5 minutes you attach and you will see the tall thin tv you know what to do okay so i'll tell you what to do now uh, go for the drug therapy so before that it is not that uh, okay fever has come i have given paracetamol i'll wait for the next fever no okay you have hyperkalemia manage it immediately recheck it immediately don't wait i'll recheck after one hour all those things okay you have started a treatment we will discuss the treatment you have started once the treatment is over you resend the sample okay and you manage the sample uh, again you manage the patient again with the level what you are getting and until the potassium is normal okay and you are not going to add any more potassium after that and you are going to monitor the potassium and continuous cardiac monitoring is going to go so this is very important not only for uh potassium potassium i'm stressing more but for sodium also it is very important to do in this cycle treatment of hyperkalemia so first thing is cardiac stabilizer uh, so almost action is immediate okay but you are not going to give it in a very rapid manner okay then that will cause a more uh, bradyarrhythmia and cardiac arrest so the action of calcium gluconate is immediate and you wanted to be there for a longer time and you wanted to happen it very slowly gradually so see and the treatment of hyperkalemia is very beautiful you remember one number one one thing you want to remember is one for hyperkalemia so what is that one calcium gluconate 10% one ml per kg maximum is 10 ml with 10 ml of 5% dextrose should be given over uh, 15 to 30 minutes so you you understood the one concept and next is to move the potassium intracellularly so when the potassium is going inside the cell you know like the t for the prisoner is going inside the cell it is still safe you know but unless or until he has changed himself or something has happened and we have removed him the world is still in danger okay so the same thing happens to the body to move the potassium intracellularly we have very quick effective methods which will work within 30 minutes first thing is easily available salbutamol embolization so this albutamol nebulization it is almost continuous okay so the dose you can take it like this you start with uh, 0.1 uh, uh, you know uh, uh, 0.1 uh, mg per kg okay or you can just go with uh, 1 ml uh, plus 3 ml and as and you you try to give continuously it's over you give it's over you give so because you have some dangerous hypokalemia happening you give and you simultaneously monitor the potassium level okay see the hypokalemia it is not going to be rapidly uh, happening with salbutamol but it it will come to a normal level near normal level quickly so second third thing what you will do is insulin and glucose see some books uh, they mention uh, at this level you give insulin and glucose at this level you give so what what i want to emphasize is don't wait for that level to come you already know more than this is going to happen something is going to happen and by giving this insulin and glucose monitoring the rbs after one hour after two hours and you know he is not going to go into hypoglycemia if you uh, properly prepare the insulin and glucose and give here again the dose is insulin it also looks like you know one i 0.1 unit per kg 0.1 okay plus glucose 1 gram per kg okay and uh, the fourth one will be bicarbonate bicarbonate it is uh, most effective if acidosis is present because i told you acidosis will bring the uh, kcl and if you are going to correct the acidosis with bicarbonate it is going to normalize and that normalization trend will uh, push the potassium inside you know that's why in dk also we uh, give uh, potassium we don't give bicarbonate for the other reasons but we give potassium supplementation once the patient pass urine and all Uh, because that acidosis normalization also will bring uh, uh, will make hypokalemia so those is again one milli equivalents per kg next is those things which work little bit slowly are oral thing you no know, those k binder c binder these are the brand names 
you know there is uh, uh, just came in the flow there is no how to say no production from them nothing like that so calexlate resins and these are the brands available in uh, shillong uh, one gram per kg is the dose oral dose Okay, in adults they go up to fifteen uh, grams, and every uh, uh, you know every uh, four hourly or six hourly it can be given. And furosemide it is uh, one milligram per kg, and uh, next will be dialysis. So when you have all these things not working because you know dialysis is not that already came you put and all those things. So dialysis is the last. First you try with all those things. While trying with all those things, after two three hours you will know it is becoming refractory. You know there is ongoing. Uh, uh, Ongoing uh, hemolysis or uh, uh, ongoing rhabdomyolysis happening. I'm not able to control. So you are in dialysis. But meanwhile, give this treatment. Okay. Main thing is from the blood you try to push inside. Okay. Next is hypokalemia. So hypokalemia. Uh, this hypokalemia it is not going to develop acutely during a hospital stay. This is like usually in background it is uh, like they are malnourished, sham patient, or uh, low intake, anorexia nervosa, or uh, they come with diarrhea, or uh, you know, and uh, uh, they have a, a renal tubular acidosis. They come with decay. Uh, they are in chronic use of diuretics. So this is like you know from the admission time this usually used to be there. And the level is three point five. So now uh, you need to really worry about this condition because it also affects the heart. Okay, but again, it is you know not sure what level what affect. But there are few things for sure. If it is going to be less than two point five, and there is going to be ileus developing, there is going to be uh, paralysis developing. You will think it's a CNS cause. You will think it's a acute abdomen. But you see. The uh, potassium has come down, so these things you must follow. You know, uh, otherwise a playing child is not. Uh, he is just telling. Uh, he is catching his leg, not willing to stand. You know, uh, so those times you uh, you have to suspect. Okay, something wrong with potassium is happening. Uh, then you need to. Uh, again, this ECG finding here it is flat T wave. That it is tall tender T wave hyperkalemia. Hypokalemia is flat T wave. Okay, now treatment of hypokalemia. So it depends on the potassium level, clinical symptoms, renal function, and what is the transcellular shift, what is the ABG acidosis, and how are the ongoing loss happening. So always oral is safer, okay? And you you must also know it is a slower also. So uh, the the taste is very bitter, you know. Don't just give like a paracetamol syrup or uh, like some any other vitamin syrup. It's very bitter. Try to mix with some juice and give dose is two to four milliequivalents per kg per day. Maximum is one twenty to two forty milliequivalents per day. Okay, and it comes in a fifteen uh, milliequivalents in uh, sorry fifteen uh, milliequivalents in twenty ml. Okay, it comes like that. So now if you are going to add like a injection, so to a IV fluid. routinely okay so or to a hypokalemia patient so what uh, uh, we follow here is 3.5 to 4.5 milliequivalents per liter you can add 1 ml which has 2 milliequivalents so same way 3 to 3.5 it will be 1.5 to 2.5 will be 3 and you will add uh, 2.5 to 3 will be 2 ml which will be 4 milliequivalents 2 2.5 will be 2.5 ml 5 milliequivalents and this amount should be this 1 ml 1.5 ml 2 2.5 ml to be added to 100 ml of maintenance iv fluid whatever you are asking uh, whatever you are doing and when you are going to put in a higher strength you really need to monitor it frequently and if you are just giving it as maintenance is stable with 3.5 to 4 you can do it once daily also choice of potassium supplementation again usual choices potassium chlorate okay and if it is with acidosis you will be giving potassium acetate or potassium citrate because the liver is going to convert them into bicarbonate and the acidosis is going to uh, reverse okay and with hypophosphatemia potassium phosphate it again depends on the availability also okay next is there are some specific situations for hypokalemia and Uh, you need to really consider them not just giving potassium 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 you know it's like not hyponatremia or all not all hyponatremia need 3% nacl similarly not hypo not all hypokalemia need uh, potassium so for example you need to decrease the ongoing loss of potassium so for example like nephrotic syndrome you are giving furosemide you anticipate you are going to give for more than you anticipate you are going to give for more than 7 days or you are going to give for a higher dose you start a potassium sparing diuretic you need not add potassium because it is again going to go out from body so you start a sparing diuretic like spironolactone it is going to maintain your potassium level and you have a 
uh, volume depleted state you are getting a metabolic alkalosis volume depleted state and hypokalemia you restore the volume with adequate sodium chloride your hypokalemia will get corrected okay so this this things are very very uh, subtle points and important because you get hypokalemia and you get a shock patient like uh, this volume depletion you restore it will get corrected on top of that you are giving potassium you know that should not happen and hypomagnesemia correct the concurrent hypomagnesemia and this are like refractory hypokalemia you are giving giving but still it is not uh, leaving you do one magnesium then hypomagnesemia is there you correct your hypokalemia will be correct so now this is one of my uh, so was supposed to be my one of my pre test pre test questions but uh, due to the uh, technical error we were not able to do it so the main thing is hyponatremia is decreased deep tendon reflux hypernatremia is increased deep tendon reflux hyperkalemia is tall tender t wave hypokalemia is flat and the patient is also flat hypotonia okay reference is manual of pediatric emergency and critical care sujitra ranj thank you and uh, any queries are welcome it's okay uh thank you dr arun for the uh, presentations so now i would like to request uh, dr kartik sir uh, to add your inputs in this regard yeah again uh, thank you dr arun for uh, comprehensively covering uh, all the uh, common electrolyte abnormalities which we uh, See, encounter in uh, PACU or any critically ill child. So, uh, starting with hyponatremia again, or uh, let's say hypo and hypernatremia, it is important to uh, club intravascular volume with your uh, abnormality, which again Arun highlighted. So, um, uh, having a hypovolemic child or a hypervolemic child or a uvolemic child. with this abnormality will also help you in uh, managing this um, the condition and uh, to uh, uh, probably put it as a common uh, bracket hypovolemic hyponatremia and similarly hypovolemic hypernatremia is the commonest uh, form of abnormality we see in children and commonly diarrhea is the one of the uh, common um, clinical condition which present with uh, both the abnormalities and uh, uh, probably to summarize hyponatremia management in any child who is symptomatic irrespective of whether uh, hypovolemic or hypervolemic you need to administer uh, a 3% uh, saline a small volume like 2 to 3 ml per kg as mentioned to correct uh, that hyponatremia or to raise the sodium level to uh, to uh, uh, to prevent the symptoms or to treat the symptoms so any symptomatic child you administer hypertonic saline small volume and then assess the volume status and decide whether you need to continue a low dose of hypertonic saline infusion or you need to correct the volume you can decide on that similarly hypernatremia again we have seen uh, diarrhea is one of the commonest cause of uh, children presenting with hypernatremia if you see uh, hypernatremia is quite common in infants young infants who are less than 1 year of age with diarrhea many a times you see sodium in the range of uh, 150 or 160 even without any other uh, complication that is because that uh, you know that infants cannot regulate their thirst so their water intake compared to the loss would be probably less and so in some cases inappropriate uh, dilution of ors and many other things would have led to this hypernatremia so again arun has highlighted in hypernatremia uh, probably any child who reaches to your uh, emergency room or uh, icu with hypernatremia it is better to presume that they have chronic hypernatremia and treat it slowly uh, as he has uh, again emphasized in the uh, uh, the the process of uh, diarrhea followed by volume loss and uh, uh, sodium increase would happen would already have happened in the previous 48 hours or more so it is better to presume that it's chronic and treat it slowly so uh, the the um, uh, method of uh, correction by giving a hypotonic fluid that is a half normal saline with added dextrose 
a 1.2 to 1.5 volume works uh, well in most of the children so you can start at a higher volume a hypotonic fluid and then most important thing is monitor sodium more frequently at least 4 hourly if possible in the first 24 hours if you monitor and uh, correct your uh, fluid volume and then probably uh, these children will recover and uh, one probably addition i would say as soon as possible you can convert the iv hydration to oral so if you are giving half normal saline 1.5 times maintenance once the child can accept the orally uh, there is no ileus then pro or uh, ng nasogastric uh, root convert or convert a part of this fluid into an ors plus feeds mixture so that uh, uh, the um, the complications associated with intravenous uh, fluid you can minimize and oral would do equally well in correcting your hypernatremia and ors the current uh, who ors is uh, hyposmolar so you can use that instead of intravenous fluid and uh, potassium abnormalities again uh, it was uh, very clearly um, explained so uh, acute hyperkalemia it is uh, uh, it, it requires immediate uh, management to prevent an arrhythmia and uh, the the different drugs and its onset of action he has uh, uh, mentioned so there is a question about salbutamol nebulization yeah so yeah in young infants it's probably not uh, uh, very effective and uh, uh, continuous nebulization is also associated with uh, probably the tachycardia and it is uh, uh, in some children in association with uh, hyperkalemia so probably uh, you can limit the doses um, if you encounter toxicity symptoms but insulin is probably the among the three fastest acting so insulin with uh, dextrose and you can repeat the doses uh, monitoring blood glucose and hypokalemia uh, treatment is straightforward you give potassium and uh, and uh, um, most units use uh, potassium mixed in uh, normal maintenance fluids uh, in escalating doses like uh, he has mentioned 10 to uh, 50 milli equivalent per liter or 1 to 5 milli equivalent per 100 ml yeah thank you thank you dr kartik sir so now i would like to request dr bipul sir to keep your thoughts with us okay uh, already uh, everything is uh, explained about uh, nicely about the electrolyte imbalance most commonly those those who are working in icus everybody encounters this type of problems means sodium and potassium abnormalities everybody is experience enough Uh, with these two types of el uh, electrolyte abnormalities so here uh, one thing was mentioned regarding sodium that diarrhea causes both hypernatremia and hyponatremia so the very true because diarrhea fluid is mostly hyponatremic the content of so sodium content of diarrhea fluid is around 55 60 like that so uh, normally uh, if there is diarrhea fluid loss is there without any other fluid intake uh, hypotonic fluid intake hyponatremic fluid intake so that child will develop hypernatremia so uh, mostly it is in infants this seen and but uh, if the child is given any inappropriate dilutional ors or plain water so in that case the child there is chance of having hyponatremia as a complications of diarrhea so diarrhea can cause both of this so this is this will cause hyponatremic dehydration hyponat hy hyponatremic uh, hypovolemia and uh, another cause is frequently encountered for hypovolemic hyponatremia is your cerebral salt wasting it is seen in very uh, cns cases mostly in management of aes cases you see and that uh, or brain death cases we see or any post operative neurosurgical cases we can see uh, that the cerebral salt wasting is very common so because of some uh, anp bnp so there will be natriuresis and child will be very rapidly he will be hypovolemic and child will go to shock so fluid replacement is and child will have very severe hypernatremia along with uh, hyponatremia along with shock hypovolemia and polyuria will be there more than 4 ml per kg per hour so in those cases we will have to uh, replace that extra uh, urine output along with some other drugs and then another uh, frequently encountered sodium abnormality is your isovolemic hyponatremia that is cr CR is very frequently encountered here all this fluid is hypotonic 
hypotonicity will be there, hyposmolar, in that already he has mentioned clearly about all these things. So we'll have to expect CR in all patients admitted in pediatric ICU. So prediction is important in management of electrolyte imbalances. So uh, in any patient, anything can, any stress can stimulate the release of, stimulate the release of ADH. So that will release, uh, retain the free water. So five, seven to 10 percent water retention will be there. The child will have some amount of uh, increase in weight gain, but the definite evident, evident edema will not be there. And but on uh, sodium, serum sodium will be less than 135 like that. So in these cases are managed with uh, mostly uh, with fluid restriction. Sometimes uh, he has mentioned about intermittent doses of furosemide, uh, or we can go for furosemide uh, infusion. Also, we can go for that. And again, another uh, and uh, things is uh, electrolyte um, uh, sodium hyper hypervolemic hyponatremia. It is seen in uh, nephrotic syndrome. So sometimes we may need to go for uh, albumin infusion along with Lasix uh, in management of those cases, hyponatremia and then cirrhosis. And in these cases, the heart space loss is very common. And so heart space losses fluid are always isotonic in nature. So ex uh, an effective intravascular volume is low in these cases, except in uh, a API cases, ARF cases, where the hyponatremia is along with severe intravascular hypervolemia will be there. So that can be managed by, so sometimes um, dialysis is required, mostly hemodialysis is more effective in management of hyperkalemia in those patients. And another, these are cases with uh, hyponatremia, another hyper, out of hypernatremia cases. So frequently we see exclusive breastfed babies who develop hypernatremia. Mostly we see in the primary mothers and who do, uh, uh, don't know actually about the technique of breastfeeding. So during the summer season, frequently we encounter cases of hypernatremic dehydration. Thus, there will be severe weight loss percentage will be very high. The serum sodium will be very high. In this management, and another cause is your central diabetes insipidus. We see in cases of ICU management, uh, where, where we manage the cases in ICU. So these are the two main cases, uh, causes of uh, hypernatremic dehydration in uh, children. And in uh, this management, uh, it, it was mentioned about 1.2 to 1.5 times of the fluid with uh, half normal saline. So half normal saline is uh, mostly used in management of hypernatremic dehydration, but sometimes we may need to, if it is very severe hypernatremia, suppose if it is more than uh, 170, 180 milliequivalent of uh, sodium, serum sodium is in those cases, so those we cannot use half NS as a for bolus purposes or even normal saline also for bolus purposes because it will be very hypotonic compared to the patient's serum sodium level. So in those cases, we need to prepare some solution of fluid for bolus purpose so that the fluid is around 15 milliequivalent uh, less than the serum sodium of the patient. So, uh, the, so these are the things which we'll have to look for. And then um, regarding potassium, he has nicely mentioned about the things. So regarding uh, that question, uh, can we use uh, salbutamol nebulization in below six months? So uh, above three months, we can use. But uh, in book, some books, it is mentioned about albuterol. And then most effective in management of hyperkalemia is your uh, glucose dextrose insulin drip. That is most effective practically. And calcium gluconate should be used. And so that is, uh, someone has asked about the doses. So it is a point, uh, the dextrose point, uh, insulin is 0.1 unit regular insulin per kg body weight. And the dose of dextrose is 25% if you are using 2 ml per kg body weight, that means 0.5 gram per kg body weight. Or if you are using 10% dextrose, then 5 ml per kg body weight. So uh, over per kg per hour. So usually we use for two to three hours. So uh, suppose for a uh, 10 kg child, uh, so the unit insulin will be 0.1 unit per hour. So for three hours, 0.3 units. And uh, that 10% extra, if you are using, so then 5 ml per kg would be, it will be for uh, 15. And for three hours, it will be 45 ml. So for 45 ml, 10% extra plus 0.3 uh, units of regular insulin, you can use uh, every 30 minutes, you'll have to look for that blood glucose level. So regarding hypokalemia is there and hypo, uh, hyperkalemia and hypokalemia. So in uh, oral potassium supplementation is always better. 
So if the child is taking orally, there is no vomiting, no abdominal distension. Mostly in uh, malnourished children, we get hypokalemia and without even, uh, so oral potassium is safer, very safer compared to IV potassium. So uh, in uh, malnourished children, we supplement this uh, potassium, that is 20, 15 ml contains 20 milli equivalent, so 2 to 4 milli equivalent per kg per day, then divided doses, we can use that amount. So very nicely presented uh, by uh, the doctor, so thank you, this much from me. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for answering the chat questions also. And then, yes, uh, Dr. Karthi, sir, have also mentioned the answer, which is asked for the dose, uh, dose of insulin. So, sir, have also answered. Hope you got the answer. And one more question is asked by Dr. DC, like, what is the maintenance fluid to use in pediatric patients? Uh, Dr. Karthi, sir, you want to answer? Yeah, so uh, in general, maintenance fluid is, is it the question uh, in pediatric patients? Okay, so uh, in all hospitalized children, there is a um, um, current uh, uh, concept of uh, uh, administering more isotonic fluids for maintenance than a hypotonic fluid. If you see, probably 10 20 years ago, we used uh, isolate P, which is uh, probably n by 4 or n by 5 uh, solution. Now we are more uh, moving towards more of a uh, isotonic fluid. So um, isotonic fluid means uh, uh, dextrose normal saline, DNS, or uh, uh, Ringer lactate with added uh, dextrose, which is a uh, little cumbersome, or a plasma light like uh, a newer balanced salt solution. But um, in, in saying so, uh, some of the children who get uh, DNS as their maintenance fluid uh, would develop hypernatremia, especially those who those who are presenting with early AKA, uh, children who are in shock and uh, developing AKA. So uh, in our unit, we use half novel saline. So I think uh, probably I can give our experience. We use N by 2, 5% dextrose as the maintenance fluid in most children. Uh, in specific cohort, we use uh, 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 normal, normal uh, DNS, like... Uh, children with, uh, let's say, dengue, children with uh, uh, encephalitis with raised intracranial pressure, where we use uh, uh, dextrose normal saline. Otherwise, half normal saline with added 5% dextrose is what we use. I think Dr. Bipul can share his uh, experience. Vipul sir, you want to share your experience? Maybe? No, he, he has nicely explained about that. Uh, I think from here. Thank you. Mm. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Karthik sir, I wanted to ask one more question to you, like which is asked by Evanderik. Like, can you give an example of how to calculate IBF accordingly for corrections of chronic hyponatremia without dehydration? If serum sodium is around one, uh, 170 milli equivalent per liter in a 20 kg child. Okay, yeah, so uh, it's a bit of a tricky question uh, because uh, uh, the uh, participant asked hypernatremia, which is chronic, but uh, without dehydration. So uh, we'll start with uh, children uh, having dehydration and hypernatremia, which is the most common scenario. Most children who develop hypernatremia, as uh, again, Dr. Bipul also em emphasized, uh, diarrhea with a uh, hypotonic uh, fluid loss and develop hypernatremia. So that is the most common scenario. And sodium of 170 is not uh, uncommon, especially when you are practicing at a tertiary care, you uh, do see. So for the ease of calculation, let's uh, take the child's weight as 10 kg. So uh, this child's uh, sodium is 170 and dehydrated uh, with a history of diarrhea he presented. And uh, um, you think renal functions are probably normal and he's uh, uh, able to pass urine. Then uh, uh, you can calculate with different formulas as again, um, uh, Arun has uh, touched, up, touched it upon. 
like uh, ml per kg 4 ml per kg body weight and uh, the desired sodium and uh, uh, free water deficit you can calculate so many things and find out a number rather it is easy for all of us uh, to start with let's say 1.5 times of maintenance fluid and a hypotonic fluid so for a 10 kg child sodium of 170 i would uh, start 1.5 liter of uh, fluid for his whole day 1.5 liter of fluid uh, that is n by 2 5% dextrose so this 1.5 liter divided by 24 uh, let's say 6 Uh, 60 ml, roughly around 60 ml, probably. So uh, 60 ml per hour of n by 2, 5% dextrose. I would start with, with 170 sodium, and then the most important thing is I'll measure sodium two to four hours later and see what is the fall. So again, um, as uh, highlighted by Arun, the fall should be roughly around 0.5 milliequivalent per hour. So in every two hour, one milliequivalent fall. So if I measure at four hours, the sodium should be somewhere around. 168 167 168 so if the if the fall is too rapid if i get a sodium of 165 then what i will do probably this fall is rapid then either you can reduce the volume from 60 ml per hour you can reduce the volume to uh, 50 or uh, 45 uh, or you can increase the normality like ra rather than n by 2 you add little bit of 3% saline in that uh, volume so you can do either way but adding sodium is cumbersome probably you can reduce the uh, volume and measure after 4 hours again so desired fall should be 0.5 ml per hour and uh, once probably after 4 4 to 8 hours i would generally start with ng feed plus uh, uh, ors or free potable water and uh, decrease the iv fluid and probably gut will take care of like uh, the the fall will be much more smoother if uh, you can uh, start orally so this is for ch children who are dehydrated and hypernatremia so now the question of uh, children without dehydration and hypernatremia the common scenario uh, would be probably an iatrogenic uh, overload with sodium someone has given soda bicarbonate outside and a uh, lot of uh, sodium has gone in or a sodium containing drugs or even 3% saline uh, in, in children with uh, let's say encephalitis you induced hypernatremia because of like to treat raised intracranial pressure and sometimes it went excessive and uh, it reached 170 so here uh, the 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 um, uh, management is probably volume may not help much you don't need to give 1.5 probably you give normal maintenance or a little bit uh, uh, more volume and uh, 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 try to uh, if if the child is hypervolemic you use a little bit of uh, diuretics as well to aid uh, 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 sodium uh, 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 to remove sodium from the body and uh, if the child is uh, provided that renal functions are normal then probably normal uh, maintenance fluid and a little bit of diuretics if uh, the child is oliguric or aneuric then probably straight away dialysis is uh, uh, is what uh, probably will be effective so that's how uh, i can summarize management of hypernatremia yeah thank you thank you so much uh, sir now i have not seen any more questions in our chat box if any of our participant would like to answer uh, questions anything you can please raise your hand or unmute yourself uh, okay i think there is no more questions so Uh, we are coming coming at the end of the session so before closing i would really wanted to thank dr kartik sir and dr bipul sir for continuously remaining with us more than 2 hours uh, actually it was up to only 4 but we got extend to with uh, 45 minutes so thank you for us uh, being with us and also thank you for giving such a deep insight and deep knowledge about the two topic weaning and as well as electrolytes so thank you once again and also uh, thank you once again for sharing your knowledge and uh, you know keeping your thoughts with us so thank you dr kartik sir and dr bipul sir thank you uh, everyone for giving me this opportunity especially himesh sir uh, who has given me this opportunity thank you once again and uh, regarding that uh, previous uh, topic uh, that pressure collin syndrome and sequence so here we can keep one lma ready for patients who, when we find any difficulty for intubating any patients 
So uh, we lost one patient. Initially, we intubated, and later on, when the patient extubated himself, and after that, we could not intubate that patient. So we had a bad experience. So uh, we could, can keep one LMA ready of uh, one size for infants and uh, bigger size for other older children. And so uh, regarding this hypernatremia, last uh, topic, uh, here we can, uh, he has very nicely explained about that. So we can calculate the solute uh, fluid deficit and free water deficit if we have time and for academic purposes. You can do that, but for practical purposes, uh, so nicely he has mentioned about 1.2 to 1.5 times of the normal requirement amount if there is dehydration. And, uh, and two fluids should be read, uh, kept ready. One is your normal saline with dextrose DNS, or one you can keep half normal saline with dextrose. So both can be kept ready. If the fluid uh, is sodium is dropping very rapidly, we can either decrease the fluid volume or we can increase the tonic. Uh, we can shift from half normal saline to uh, DNS. So thank you. Thank you very much. It is very nice to. Thank you, you so the... much, sir. It was a real pleasure having uh, both of you, sir, Dr. Vipul and Dr. Karthi. Uh, mm -hmm. You have uh, more, like you have answered all the questions and like really well uh, explained to all our participants and cleared most of our doubts as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, I thoroughly enjoyed the participation. Thank you yes, very sir. much. Yes. And uh, I'm I'm really uh, grateful that uh, your uh, uh, Capacity building is uh, it, it's close to my heart and it's very important and I'm uh, really happy that uh, uh, you are organizing and doing it uh, really well. Thank you. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for your support. So I would also like to thank today's presenter, Dr. Rosina Ma'am and Dr. Arun sir, for uh, uh, these things presenting in such a well uh, way. So thank you once again. And uh, thank you all the participants who are present today with us till the end of the session. So thank you all. And I also wanted to wish, uh, actually Dr. Arun is going from the Nigrim. So we wanted to wish him good luck for his upcoming future. So he's going for further study in Medhanta Delhi. So uh, Dr. Arun, thank you so much and wish you good luck for your upcoming future. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for uh, the uh, for adding your for input. adding your inputs and uh, thank sharing you for your sharing experience. your experience. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. So I think I will end our session. Thank you. Mm -hmm.